Okay. Um, welcome today to today's session of Open Texas 2022. I am Alexa Height with the Open Texas Conference Committee and will be emceeing our session this afternoon. Thank you all for joining us today for Controlling the Means of Publication, a Marxist Interrogation of OER Production. We ask that you mute your microphones and turn off your video feed and screen unless you are presenting. Um, and I am going to ask that Justin take it away for us. Hey, the way I had to share my screen is a little different than normal, so hopefully it won't cause a problem. All right. Hi, everybody. I'm Justin White. I'm a scholar communications librarian at the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley. I will start off with my thesis for this talk. Uh, open education will be subsumed into the same systems we critique now without a consistent and ongoing critique of capitalism. We will be sold courseware built on OER, no longer controlled by the authors, charged book publishing charges for the privilege, and continue to pad corporate profits. Uh, we will have wasted our time. There's a, uh, a there are levels of capitalist critique. I don't expect you to become an anarcho-syndicalist by the end of this talk, um, but there is nothing ideologically keeping you from being aware of how, how the relationships of production affect your life negatively and how they interact with the way that we do our job every single day because we spend a vast majority of our life working, a uh, vast majority of our day. It's really important to think about how those relationships interact um, and how those series of relations impact uh, the work of our lives. So. There is a very classic sort of uh, critique whenever you bring up a, a critical response to particularly like capitalism or any kind of uh, hegemonic system, which is how will blank work um, under a different system. And the response that is I always find the most productive is how do we do those things now? So with the question of how are we going to produce OER in a way that is equitable, in a way that reflects our values, in a way that's decentralized? Um, how will authors get paid? How do they get paid now? And how will educational materials get updated? How do they get updated now? The large amount of labor done every day to build educational materials or modifying them that is unrecognized, not shared, and repeated unnecessarily. And that is how the majority of educational materials get created and updated um, with very little recognition, with very little support, and with no pay. Uh, how can we utilize and so I want to, uh, to imagine how can we utilize open education as a chance to change this series of relations where we're not constantly reinventing the wheel, where people are not constantly having to replicate the same work, that they can work in ways that are collaborative rather than competitive. Um, again, reflecting some of the themes that we had during the keynote this morning. A problem that we have particularly, and, as, and the reason for this talk, um, to talk specifically about ideology is because the open education movement, the open access movement, it has a lot of uh, more reactionary ideology behind it than you might imagine. There is a lot of cyber libertarian lines of thought that abound in open access. Uh, if you've ever heard mottos, things like information wants to be free or that there is no transmission costs in the age of the Internet. These are fundamentally not true things. They're fundamentally reactionary things. And they are things that ignore the actual labor that goes into creating networks and distributing things and distributing particularly the, the products of people's labor. Um, there's a, a paper here by Neri and Wynn. This is open access is more about the freedom of things rather than a freedom of people. And that's going to be something I want to focus on is how are we controlling our labor? How are we doing labor in a way that aligns with what we value um, in terms of um, equity, diversity, inclusion, accessibility? You can't do those things if you're alienated from your labor. I'm probably going to repeat myself a couple times, um, but it's just the nature of the way that this talk uh, has come about. So cyber libertarian lines of thought, as I said, are particularly right wing things. Um, if you are um, familiar with the term liberal communism, um, you might be aware that that is a contradiction in terms. It is an idea that is uh, used as a critique 
of particularly um, extremely rich philanthropies. So, so think of like the Gates Foundation. Um, the idea is that the utopia that could be dreamed about in communism will be brought about by liberal markets and be brought about particularly by the charity of the extremely rich. Um, and so there are these tenets of liberal communism, uh, giving everything away for free, free access, no copyright, just charge for the additional services that will make you rich. Um, you will change the world, not just sell things. You'll be sharing, aware of social responsibility. You can see how these things permeate the way we talk about open education and open access. The problem is ideologically behind them, they take absolutely no problem with the exploitive means uh, and relationships that are inherent in capitalism, the sort of extraction of uh, value from surplus, uh, the, the extraction of surplus value from labor. Uh, it's the sort of model that says charity can fix issues that capitalism exacerbates, sort of ecological damage, colonial damage. Um, it can it can resolve its own contradictions, um, which of course is is what the the sort of communist project was about, which was resolving the contradictions inherent in capitalism and moving to a different stage of society. There's an imagination that we're at the end of history. Uh, there is a, a, a capitalist hedge money. We're not going to move to another system. And therefore, the system has to iron out its own issues. Um, and that it can do that through charity and through uncritically reproducing its, its, the, the things that it's already been doing. Academics have already been conditioned to give away the products of their labor for free, building immense wealth for information analytics companies. Um, I don't want to refer to them as publishers because uh, they have rebranded themselves unless it's useful for them to refer to themselves as publishers. So uh, information analytics companies, um, open access should reverse that trend. Instead of giving away the products of our labor for free uh, and building immense wealth uh, for extractive industries, it should be about maintaining control of labor um, and the products of that labor if there ever has to be a, a transfer of intellectual property, it should be done with upfront payments for writing, editing, reviewing, illustration, and recording, rather than handing those things away where they can be bundled. Uh, more labor can be exploited in the form of copy editors and illustrators uh, who work for those companies and then sold back to the public. Um, this is just an excerpt from the Communist Manifesto. There's a part buried towards the end. Um, where we're talking uh, uh i'm gonna skip this slide uh rather than giving away intellectual property we should focus on retaining control uh, by authors editors reviewers by the public by the section of the economy as a whole that does educational work uh, that we can refer to as quote the academy um, i like referring to this whole realm of educational work as the academy it's kind of misleading because it sounds like I'm talking about higher education as a whole, but actually what I'm talking about is this blob of labor that includes both publishers and higher education and K through 12 education and thinking of that as a whole unit of industry. And how can everyone involved in that process control the outcomes in the work in the way that is more equitable? So we want more control over the products of our labor, not less. Um, when one of the, the critiques of open access and open education is the abolition of property cannot precede the abolition of capitalist relationships. Asking one sector to give up its labor is a reactionary tendency that is especially effective on not particularly class conscious academics. And you can read probably more about this in Gramsci where he talks about intellectuals and, and their class position. Um, we have to ask ourselves seriously, how can we impart our values into the products of our labor that we no longer control? Inclusivity, diversity, and equity, all of those can be built into the foundations of a publishing program that is controlled locally, controlled by the authors, controlled by um, public institutions. From how we treat authors to how we distribute material to students. 
you might be familiar with uh, vocational off about the ETAR's um, sort of landmark paper that really brought to for uh, brought to um, the foreground um, the almost religious nature of the way we talk about our work. Um, you might have saw this. There was a question in the Q and A um, during um, Jasmine Roberts Cruz. Uh, keynote, which was, isn't creating these things just part of my job? And the question I would respond, I would respond to this person by saying, yes, but do you own the course materials that you develop? What are the intellectual property policies at your university? Um, if you are fired, can they just teach your course without you? Um, in the University of Texas system, for example, you own your course materials, but if you are separated from the university, they retain a license to the work for one year after you leave. We are already spending a significant amount of money in buying for profit materials, uh, as we do with journals, as we do with textbooks. Um, we, we offset a lot of that cost by passing it on to students through library fees and buying the textbook themselves. Um, as if there there aren't other things out there that make money like this is like a moral issue it's a moral problem um if we're talking about um making public the infrastructure that does this publishing that it was previously private i think you'll probably run into that eventually the ideology is always going to show itself at some point and say like well actually making profit is a good thing and if you don't have a consistent critique of capital you're going to go yeah i guess so um, and you're going to ask yourself, okay, well then what actually am I trying to do here? Um, and as I said in my thesis statement, I think the answer would be we're just wasting our time. Public institutions are already spending this money to pay for the labor that creates educational materials, outsource them, buy them back in various different ways. That money can already be used to publicly own educational materials and journals. We just have to prioritize that spending in that direction, building the infrastructure that we want. Um, I'm already going over time, so I have to skip a little bit. There has to be a shift of power and a shift of the means of producing our own educational materials into the academy. Remember, this is the whole industry I'm talking about. I'm talking about it from like a syndicalist point of view. Um, if you know me, you know that I'm a member of the industrial workers of the world. I'm a wobbly, I'm an anarcho syndicalist. I believe that an entire industry could actually self organize itself into such a way that uh, it can control the, the outcomes of its own labor, the products of its own labor. And I'm suggesting this is what you would have to do to have an effective open educational movement. It means there has to be a drastic shifting of institutional spending priorities, shifting material costs onto the institution and off of the students who pay it to information analytics companies formerly known as publishers. These costs will have to be defrayed by additional state support, either through direct funding from college and university administration or external grants. I meant to put external there. Direct funding is ideal because it can be sustained over longer periods of time and it shifts institutional commitments. Once you've already made the change, it's a lot easier to keep it going. Uh, it's a lot easier to build inertia, to, to build momentum. Um, when you have these one time external grants, if the funding leaves after a few years without building actual capacity for continuing that work, that's a problem. And also consider, definitely don't have time to get into this, but temporary grant funding uh, hires and the labor and equity issues therein, particularly think of like um, short term grant funded positions uh, for people to do diversity work. You spend one year of those three years getting ready to take on that job, and you spend the third year of that, those three years looking for your next job. Um, it, it burns people out. It, it doesn't really solve any of the equity issues in librarianship in particular. Um, again, don't have time to get into it. Uh, what I do and how you can do it, support staffing um, is a common problem. You are understaffed and constantly overpromising. Uh, shifting priorities of faculty and staff. Uh, again, like I said, shifting where we're spending money and how we're spending money. Building infrastructure in a complex organization is tough. You have to pitch ideas. You have to avoid overcommitment. Uh, no one likes it when they put all this upfront work into, you know, working on a new open education project and then 
the support gets pulled because you've overcommitted. It's a tight balancing act, but it's really um, it's really important to keep in mind that all stages of uh, building um, capacity at your institution. Draft policies that maximize creator control over works. Um, make sure that the authors, editors, um, any people who are going to be paid for creating uh, materials also still maintain intellectual property rights over it. Um, I do get this question sometimes from faculty. What if I can just make a textbook and sell it and live off their royalties? I have said to faculty members pretty much verbatim, you should absolutely do that. If, if that's how you're going to make a living, I'll help you find a publisher. The thing is, like I mentioned, it doesn't happen for most people. Um, most of this, this labor of creating educational materials is unpaid, unacknowledged and repeated again and again, because it's not shared and done communally. Um, if we are going to fund like OER in our institutions, we want to and, and we're going to say offer uh, an upfront payment because you're not going to get royalties. Uh, you are going to get paid and you retain the copyright over it. We're just asking that you put like an open license on it. And as I was writing this slide, I thought, hey, that's like a reverse article processing charge or author processing charge. So that's a fun idea. Um, what I would like to do, I would like to see consortial publishing and cataloging of OER. I would like to see sharing the cost of building infrastructure, hiring editorial and support staff. I'm thinking particularly of building consortial models like Texas Digital Libraries as a possible way of doing and funding and sharing and building capacity for this sort of work. I would like to break off pieces of large publishers. Uh, again, I'm talking about open access journals a little bit, but flipping journals to university presses, but also decentralized learning material production. As we know, you know, you've got Cengage, you've got Pearson, and they're probably going to start eating up the rest of them. You know, I don't even have to remember all the other publishers' names. Incentivize hiring teaching support staff to move away from courseware that automates grading and surveils students. Um, that one might be a little bit tricky depending on your field. Um, it's a big ask. I know it's a big ask. I'm asking you to, you know, find ways to hire more people. Labor is always the biggest cost, but here we're here to talk about labor. And there are remaining concerns that I have if I was going to, when, when I think about the long term project of open education, particularly like holding intellectual property and trust. Like I said, if we ask for a one time payment for labor, like uh, you've done illustrations, you've done peer review, you've done editing. It's hard to have people maintain sort of editorial control over those things. So you just ask them to transfer the IP over to you. But now who is the IP held by? Do you trust the institution that's going to hold those things? Is your institution going to hand off that IP to something else, uh, wrap it in courseware and sell it as a product? You know, it's a question you have to ask yourself. Privacy and anonymity. Um, authors who face backlash when their work, particularly work focused on feminist and queer theories, um, have a distrust of open access and open educational resources because it allows uh, virality to sort of come after them, right? You have to have policies in place to protect your authors, even if you know those policies are not going to be equitably put into place. Uh, as I was talking with um, Emily Knox the other day, um, who is an instructor at library school, um, you still have to put those policies in place because otherwise you have nothing in place. Um, and this is even a question as we are talking about the prestige economy, as we're talking about publishing, why do we even have certain faculty publish at all? Um, does the open education movement ask us, uh, give us an opportunity to change tenure requirements, job requirements, knowing that certain scholars are going to be in put into a position that is more tenuous based on the subject matter they teach. And I always bring this up, exploitation of student labor and open pedagogy. Are you using students to generate OER because there's no money to pay for OER production? I feel like I always see at least one presentation in each open education conference where I have to raise this issue. Again, what are your spending priorities? Um, if you don't have the money to do something equitably, should you even be doing it? Um, again, this, is, this goes back to overcommitment. This goes back to, um, you know, pitching an idea in a complex organization. It might take years. It might never happen at that institution. 
So I had to rush through this. I got only 20 minutes, um, but I will be happy to answer any questions in chat. Thanks. Thank you, Justin. We do have a couple of minutes. It's 2.23. Our next presentation begins at 2.25. So if there are any questions, um, I welcome folks to unmute um, or drop your questions in chat. Um, that was very interesting. Yeah, that was roughly the reaction I was looking for. Um, Leah has a question. She says, if you have any links where we can learn more, can you share them here? And then April asks, if an OER creator chooses a CC license that is not NC and a publisher wants to use it without pay, what to do? At that point, it's too late. You have to talk to your, if you are going to be supporting a publishing um, a, a, a publishing sort of collective or, or process, um, all of these things need to be brought up in the, the creation phase of saying like, these are the possible risks. Um, you don't want to find that out. You, and you definitely don't want the faculty member to find that out later because that's gonna cause an issue of trust. Um, even if you didn't mean to screw up, even if you forgot to mention it, they're going to think, oh, you don't know what you're talking about, or um, you've put me in this awkward situation now. Um, so you have to anticipate a lot of things. Um, and again, this is where crafting really detailed policy comes into play. And I think also why consortial models are a good one, because you can share those policies. You know, at TDL, we share a lot of policies for um, um you know open access journals yeah very true um it is 225 so again if you do have more questions for justin please put them in the chat um and justin might be able to answer them there um welcome to this next session of open texas 2022 i am alexa height with the open texas conference committee and will be emceeing this next session um we thank you for joining us today for the labor of implementing a legislative mandate um, and just a reminder to mute your microphones and turn off video feed uh, or screen sharing if you are not presenting um, I'm now going to mute myself and start sharing Leah's slides. Thanks, Alexa. And thank you, Justin. I really appreciated the lens that you brought to your previous presentation, and I was so absorbed in it that I completely forgot I was presenting. So, whew, okay, I'm going to get my head in the game. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Leah DeForest. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the communications manager and OER support service lead with Texas Digital Library. I'm also a member of the Open Texas Steering Committee. I'm really glad that you all have joined my session and that we are still here together on Friday afternoon. Uh, the session will be about how we can support each other in the emotional labor of uh, rolling out a legislative mandate. So um, just a reminder, this session is being recorded. So I understand if you're uncomfortable sharing publicly or speaking up here today, you can message me or my co-moderator, um, Alexa. We can address your questions anonymously. And I'm also gonna drop my email in chat right now. So if you wanna follow up with me later for a one-to-one -one meeting, um, the door is open. Next slide, please. So I have a few slides that will act as a guide for discussion and I'll have some questions for everyone on most of the slides. So please feel free to drop your input in chat if you if you care to, otherwise uh, having that input stay in your head is also okay. Uh, you'll likely see resources throughout the presentation that you're very familiar with, and that's by design. I think it's important to return to the resources that are already available and for us to build on the work of my peers and predecessors, no matter what the project and especially seems fitting for OER. Additionally, we always have new people joining our field since OER is relatively nascent and a welcome to you if that is you here today. Um, so if these resources are new to you, that's great. And I'll share links in chat where you can access them when you want. So today, I hope that we can find a way to continue the work that our peers have begun and add to our voices, add our voices to some of the tools that exist. On the slide that's up right now, I've posted a page from the Scholarly Publishing and Academic Resources Coalition, or SPARC, 
a page from their OER policy playbook. And what you're seeing here is a list of 10 good policy practices that are, they've outlined. Today, we're here. We're going to look at uh, the policy play number eight, institutional OER policies. Policymakers can prompt institutions to develop their own OER policies. And that's what this is all about. Next slide, please. So I've listed on the slide two of the most recent and possibly well-known OER legislations here in Texas. And there are, of course, federal laws around OER as well. The laws I'm more familiar with focus are, are specifically focused here in Texas and came from Texas. Other states have OER legislation too. Um, the Texas has, uh, Texas has other laws around OER. So please know this isn't an exhaustive list, just where I'm starting from. The first one is Texas Senate Bill 810, SB 810, um, that discusses the purchase and use of OER. It's best known for the course markings requirements. Some of you have maybe heard of that or worked on that on your campus. And the other one that I'll uh, just, just to have you in, have this in your head. We're not gonna go into detail around these because <laughs> we'll all just wanna leave. Um, but uh, House Bill 1027, which relates to the disclosure of certain information regarding the textbooks and learning content systems by certain institutions of higher ed. Maybe you're familiar with these. And again, I'm gonna drop some info here in chat where you can access information about those bills and Sparks um, OER policy tracker. Next slide, please. So I mentioned previously, there's um, some tools and resources that already exist. I've put some on the slide. I'll drop them here in chat. Um, these tools and resources will help you on how to start the work of implementing a legislative mandate. Um, the first resources on the list was developed by um, very dear and highly respected colleagues at UT Arlington. Their Texas toolkit for OER course markings is especially helpful. Um, it's a guide and a framework for navigating, um, if anything, the partners you will need to start this work. Um, that is um, a, a resource that's a lib guide. And so we'll be sharing a link to that here in a sec. Um, Sparks resources also are, are really key to providing a solid foundation for anyone working on a legislative mandate. And this they'll provide a wide lens towards the OER landscape across the US, but also state by state. And um, finally, just the, the overall feel and, and really um, thrust of my presentation today is inspired by the work of my colleagues who are librarians um, and members of Texas Digital Libraries OER ambassadors. And I'm building on the OER roundtable that they hosted at the Texas Conference on Digital Libraries last May. Um, so let me grab some of these links. These are great resources, every single one. Um, and I invite you all, if you have something along this same vein, to please go ahead and share in chat so others can see it. So these resources are, are re have really good input on how to get started, what to do next, et cetera. But today we're gonna focus on something uh, that we may not have a toolkit around and it's on the emotional labor done by the people who do the work of implementing these um, gigantic projects, these state mandates. Next slide, please. So state legislative mandates like um, House Bill 1027 or Senate Bill 810 have initiated a lot of big changes. And there are a lot of positive impacts around these changes. Um, this, this translates to a lot of work for um, some of my colleagues here in this room, but also across the state in Texas. And these mandates are certainly not perfect and they don't address the myriad of issues facing students seeking higher education. Um, However, um, as many of us have, have seen, um, recent actions taken by Texas government are actively harmful towards human beings. So in the words of many of my colleagues, this legislation is not perfect, but I will take it over nothing. And so we're gonna start by looking at what's positive about some of these legislative actions. I'd love to hear what you've observed that you think is positive about SB 810, 1027, House Bill 1027. I have started a list here this is not an exhaustive list, but I think alone just awareness that people became, if they hadn't heard of OER before then on your campus, it's very possible that having a legislative mandate made them aware at that point. That in turn prompted action in a climate of lethargy or for lack of a better word, not 
you know, lethargy might not be the most descriptive for every attitude, but certainly it can feel like that when we're trying to motivate people to help us with their work. There were immediate um, savings for students in terms of, yes, thank you, Nathan. Hi, Nathan, um, for the course tagging. Um, you know, that's where students can see where they can immediately save money on their courses. So that had some really positive impact on students and their parents and families. And I'm gonna keep moving, but if you think of any other positives, the THEC OER grant program has also been excellent. Thank you so much, THECB and to Nathan too. So next slide. Um, now we all might have heard of these challenges, but there's a lot of challenges around the, the implementation of these laws. Again, this is just a start, but please continue with the positive impacts and if you have any other challenges that you've experienced. So yesterday's keynote with Jasmine Roberts Cruz, she mentioned that open and, and the, the theories and, and methods of open don't always fit with the rigidity of the hierarchies and structures in higher education. I think that's a very broad umbrella, which a lot of other bullet points could fit under, but I wanted to reiterate that. One of the questions was, who is actually in charge here? And, and if the person running point on these projects, are they really the person who has the authority and name recognition and perhaps title to be um, responsible for such massive amounts of work. Um, and also, again, to the point of this isn't perfect. <laughs> Are we doing enough for students? Are these really doing enough um, to help students, real human beings on the ground visiting campus food banks, for example? If there are any other challenges you've experienced, please remember this is not this is a safe space. If you need to message me privately or bring it up in an email, that's fine too. Next slide, please. So I just want to highly encourage us, and, and by us, I mean those literally here together in this Zoom room, as well as our OER colleagues in Texas and beyond. I just highly encourage us, <clears throat> excuse me, to continue to build on those toolkits and resources that exist by adding our own voices. And one piece that I think is missing around this work and one, one piece that I think this conference is entirely geared towards is addressing the labor, the invisible labor, the emotional labor and immense pressure put on people who are implementing these changes on their campuses. So again, I've started a little list here on the slide, but please feel free to add your own um, areas where you're seeing that we need to acknowledge and support emotional labor. So that huge pressure, the huge responsibility that you know, we talked about, being um, someone who's in charge of campus teams and, and, and huge projects that manage really desperate um, divisions across campuses. Some of the people doing this work are on precarious foundations. As uh, Jasmine Roberts Cruz and Karen Congelosi mentioned, the people in charge may not have faculty status they may already be overwhelmed in a crushing workload. Um, they are, could possibly be burdened by systemic racism, sexism, homophobia that oppress us and harm us or our families, and yet they show up every day and do their work. There's disconnection, um, certainly between the people who make these laws and who carries out the work, and also how the work that's carried out may be disconnected from who benefits from them. You know, I've talked to some folks who just feel like they're passing stats from one party to another. You know, they're getting stats to prove the need to OER to one group and then getting stats to prove that OER is working to another um, while literally build the plane, uh, building the plane as they're flying it. And, you know, they don't likely see a lot of thank you letters, which is, of course, not to be expected, but I think just by design, this, the nature of this work is highly invisible and can feel really burdensome. The overconnection. So this is a word, I couldn't think of a great word, but I thought of overconnection. This is a word I'm using for my sort of trauma-informed response, where sometimes I'm looking for anyone who is willing to help me move this mountain. And many of the relationships that I've cultivated, and maybe yours too, um, that, that you've cultivated and maintained are really powerfully strategic with long game plays in mind and big benefits in mind. However, with every new relationship means you need to make sure that you maintain that relationship. How do you keep those folks engaged? How do you keep, help them help you and keep them with you along this journey to get to the end when the thing is done? 
So again, in chat, you're welcome to share some of the other emotional labors or invisible labors that you've experienced. Um, and we'll move on to the next slide where this is really, a, um, I see this mini tiny presentation as just a beginning where I just wanna mention that we need to work on supporting each other. Um, so many of us are facing similar troubles every day. And what can we do to support each other? I mean, obviously we can't just have a group hug at the end of every day. And some people might really not want that. And I get that. But I have some ideas on what we can do to start supporting each other. And would love to hear if you have ideas and also any other um, actions that maybe you've taken. So building on each other's work, referencing the work that's happened in, before you um, and trying to add to it and build to it, build upon it, singing each other's praises. So whether you're on the same campus or the same system, across a system, across a state, I think singing the praises of our, our colleagues' work is a really important way to build community. Finding common ground is, is sort of, there's sort of an overlap there, but what I'm envisioning is sometimes within the same um, local communities, we're working in the same apps, for example, the same learning content management systems or, or other technological tools. When we find our common grounds at, the, at a minimum, Let's try to find ways that we're not working against each other. And then finding a space to talk about our challenges. So Open Texas, that's what this is for. This whole conference has been about, let's talk about our challenges around our work, the things we do and, and, and try to accomplish every day and some of the barriers that stand in front of them. Um, there are other avenues to talking about challenges, but I think it's very helpful to see um, others going through similar struggles and finding that common ground and then looking for common solutions. And so for my last slide, I just, again, this is the beginning. And I wanna thank you for joining here today and hope this sparked a little um, thought uh, you know, among the group here. I'd really like to continue to building, uh, build this community with you. Um, we're all working towards the same goal, which is helping students be able to be who they want to be. And some of you here today have heard me say this a hundred times, but as a student uh, in community college who still, even though community college is affordable, I couldn't afford the textbook and I had to drop out of a number of classes. This is my way of paying it forward. And I really appreciate the work that you all are doing. I'll share some links in chat um, in a little bit where you can find um, an OER community that's um, comprised of librarians and some faculty. The Texas Digital Library has a, a welcoming um, OER community uh, through listservs and we have Slack and we have meetings and we just don't want you to go it alone. Let us help you with all of your OER labors, emotional, invisible, legislative mandate driven, anything else we're here to help. And I um, think I'm all set Alexa and just thank you all for taking time to spend with us today. Sorry about that. I was having my own technical difficulties. Thank you, Leah, so much for um, sharing on on that. I think you know this this whole um, conference has really demonstrated the issues and the, the in, as you mentioned invisible issues behind um, OER labor. Uh, we do have about ten minutes before our next um, presenter, so feel free to ask any questions of Leah or of each other. I love all the links that were shared. Um, I'm going to mute myself um, and make sure our next presenter is ready to go. Um, Heidi Winkler and Sabrina Davis were in another presentation. Weren't you, weren't you talking about um, imposter syndrome among librarians? Yes, we were. I wish I could have been there, but I think I was talking at the same time. <laughs> yes, you were getting ready to talk. <laughs> yes, and I and Heidi and Sabrina, I just um, when I saw your presentation, I thought, oh my gosh, maybe we're talking about the same things, but of course we're not, and that's okay. I just um, I just appreciate. I think everyone um, who I've been talking to, both on the on the conference planning side and and guests, just are enjoying feeling very seen this week. And um, I hope that feeling continues um, to, for everyone out there that 
we see you and um, we, we understand the struggle. Amber, hi, I'm going to, oh, and also think, oh, hi, Gabby. Um, I'm going to send some, I'm digging up some links. I didn't have them at the ready, sadly. It's just going to take me a minute. But I will happily send um, some links here where folks can get involved. And it's a really low key, it's a lot like this meeting where some people are chatty, like me, some people are not, it's okay. Um, and uh, it's a very open and, and low key welcoming community. And holy smokes, Heidi. Yes, <laughs> the emotional toll is a lot. I think because we don't always see the benefactors of our of our work, you know, in some ways, like when when if you do get to talk with a student who's benefited, even if they don't know the term OER, you can sort of like, OK, I'll take this and I'll nibble this little treat for at the end of my days because it's all I have to keep me going. and. I think that's part of the invisible work that makes it even harder. Certainly in the in terms of the imposter syndrome, which <clears throat> again, I just I, I'm gonna go back and watch your the recording of your session, but you know, speaking to, to the person who's the point of contact, contact, who's the who's the point person? Are they faculty? Do they have a fancy title? Or are they literally running around? begging people to listen to them. And so um, the imposter syndrome is high among this group uh, because of the subject matter expertise um, of each, uh, uh, you know, focus or study. They, they clearly aren't gonna have all that. OER and open ed is still a, a fairly nascent field. Um, we're only now in Texas starting to see those kinds of librarianships become, you know, paid positions separate from other librarian jobs. And so there's still a, a lot of imposter syndrome among our own community because, oh, I don't know that much about OER. None of us do. We, we just don't. We, we just don't. Um, and so I think that there's just, um, uh, and Nathan just said it, it's so hard because it's difficult to get recognized in the existing structure, structures, exactly. And Nathan's faculty, so even there, you know, he's probably seeing that his work as an OER coordinator, although I hear that changed, is not being appreciated or recognized. It's not a moneymaker, certainly. Um, I Yeah, I really appreciate what Nathan said and also what Sabrina said about the support that TDL, Texas Digital Library, gives. Um, I, I'm the scholarly communication and copyright librarian on my campus, and I felt like an imposter talking to faculty about publishing when, as a librarian faculty, I'm not expected to do as much publishing. And so talking to faculty about open access and OER and um, TDL really helped me with that, my imposter syndrome as well. So yeah, big shout out to all the labor that TDL does that they don't always get recognized for as well. Um, we do have about four minutes before our next session. Um, feel free to keep, keep it up in chat, but feel free to take a break as well if you need it. I'm just gonna unmute momentarily to make sure everything's working. Sounds good. Is that Nathan? That's me. Hi, Leah. How are you doing? Hi. I'm doing really well. I've been thinking of you. I heard you um, moved into a more full-time faculty role. Congratulations. Well, yeah, I've got a, um, I'm in the interim chair of the philosophy, humanities, and library sciences department now, which is, which is good. Um, it's funny, Justin was saying in the chat, um, also, hey, Justin, um, pretty cool to follow the two of you. Um, in this in this little uh, segment, but he was saying like you know, passing on work, and I we've passed it on to another OER coordinator. So actually, uh, Jim Ross Nazal, who's who is one of the on the committee for this conference, is now the OER coordinator at HCC. And I mean, I think you're right that there's duplicated labor, but the the way I look at it is that like the more people who learn how to do the job and what the job is about, the more normalized it'll get in the institution. So I actually, I kind of always thought I would step away from being OER coordinator after a few years. And so I'm happy to have Jim take over. 
I'm the MC from our keynote earlier today. Sorry. And Justin had a really good point too um, in the chat real quick, but just that, you know, worrying that many people are gonna move up the ranks uh, and, you know, this will be a high overturn <laughs> position. I think um, we're, I mean, I've seen that. It's also really hard to fill positions um, in Texas right now, unless they're offering full-time remote uh, and so in libraries. And so I think um, there's a lot of duplicated effort. There's a lot of onboarding that gets, um, or like the oral history, you know, gets retold and, and playing telephone. So I'm with you, Justin. And that's again, why I'd love to invite folks to join our community because that's one way. That's just one, one avenue towards trying to get everybody on the same page. Yeah, I was thinking specifically of what April asked about, you know, what happens when the when a faculty member comes up with this situation where their work is being commercialized and they didn't want it to be. Um, you know, that's a lesson I was thinking you really can only learn with experience, but that there can be shortcuts to learning those sorts of things. And I think consortial work is the the best way to share policies and get you thinking of like, oh, right, this is something I need to think about beforehand. And so the more people are just writing, you know, more incentivized to write policy rather than like academic journal papers, I think. If we were sharing policies constantly, I think we'd be in a much better place. Mm, giving me an idea. I'm going to go ahead and test out sharing my screen here, see how that goes. Go for it. Yeah, we have just about a minute until our next start time. Oh, yeah, this is uh, this is good. Uh, shoot. <laughs> hey, everybody, it is 2.50, so we are going to get started if we can uh, figure out our our screen sharing and Nathan, let me know if you need to send them to me and I can advance. Yes, yeah, so uh, this is going to be fun. I give, I will be back in 30 seconds, but okay. the new computer and privacy settings are going to force me to quit Zoom and come back. So I'll be right back. No worries. I just went through that a few weeks ago. Um, while Nathan's figuring that out, I will get the housekeeping out of the way. So welcome to this afternoon session of Open Texas 2022. I am Alexa Height with the Open Texas Conference Committee and will be emceeing this session. Thank you everyone for joining us for OER funding models and the labor theory of value. Um, just a reminder to mute your microphones and video if you are not uh, speaking. Um, and we should have time at the end to do some Q&A. So after uh, Nathan rejoins us, uh, we will try and get, um, get him started on time, hopefully. Um, and thank you, Leah and Justin, for, the, for starting us off on this afternoon session. Excellent presentations. Thanks, Alexa, you're doing great. All right, I am back and let's try the sharing screen now. Oops. Oh no, it's disabled for me. I came I in probably, through the I link. Probably, I have to make you a co-host again since you left, so. Sorry, yep. Okay. No, you're fine, you're fine. All right, give it a try now. Great, looks good, looks good. Um. All right, and we are there. This should be good. Excellent. Okay. Well, thanks you all for sticking around um, to on a Friday afternoon to listen to labor theory of value and so forth. <laughs> this continues my uh, personal sort of um, uh, trend uh, at at least at Open Texas. It seems to talk about economics and um, OER. So. Um, Let's see here. Okay. So uh, the some you might 
you might have heard these before. Uh, some people uh, make the following criticisms of OER. You see this a lot. You know, well, without the monetary incentives of copyright, why will people create textbooks or other learning materials, right? And then our, other times people, you, you know, take it from a different direction. Instead of saying, you know, there's no incentive, they say, look, people deserve the money they make from royalties or sales. It's not fair to require them to give that work away. Um, and I think these are, you know, legitimate questions, and but they're really embedded within a a view of um, of economics and economic transactions that I I think is um, you know potentially problematic, and certainly I think not the ideal way to think about open education or maybe even education in general. But I'm going to sort of look at this. So my thesis is that. Um, actually, uh, OER, the way that we fund OER typically is a more just and a more sustainable way of funding the creation of educational materials than the commercial bot models that are used for producing textbooks and other learning materials. So, um, brief sort of econ 101 sort of model of uh, how we tend to value commercial um, textbooks. So you've, you, these are going to be familiar to you, but I'm just getting them out there into the um, onto the table for us. So first of all, we have this idea that a market, a free market, uh, determines the value of products based on their exchange rates or based on the, the amount that someone's willing to pay for it. And that, um, this, this uh, picture on the right is a, a typical supply demand curve, right? So the price is that intersection between supply and demand. Um, that's what determines the price. So the idea is like, you can sell your product for whatever price people are willing to pay. Um, you know, as, as supply goes up, uh, you know, you've, you, you, you know, that, that may push down the price because, you know, there's going to be enough to satisfy the demand out in the market. Or like, as we see now, you know, prices are rising partly because supply is constricted. So that's kind of the basic like theory of, uh, of, uh, or, um, sort of pricing in a free market. Um, but in the textbook market, we don't really have a free market. Um, in fact, uh, you know, students don't really have a choice about what textbooks they read. They're assigned textbooks by a faculty member or, or maybe monographs or whatever is the teaching materials or learning resources that you're using. Um, and also the money that's used to produce and sometimes even buy the textbooks is not really the you know, uh, money that's 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 obtained by um, individuals. It's it's actually government funded, right? So mo or most of our uh, textbook purchases come from either loans or grants that are sponsored by the federal government. Um, most of the materials that you find in textbooks are the product of research done at universities, which in some way or another are funded by state uh, funds in some at least in some degree. So. Um, we'd really have a distorted market. And as a result, we've, we've got a situation where the, uh, the, the, the textbook market doesn't look like a free market at all. It's a totally unsustainable and completely lopsided market. So we know this if we look, for instance, at um, the price changes over time. Uh, look at the CPI. So this is a familiar table probably to many people. Um, and the textbook, college textbooks, is this orange line up at the top there. You can see it just massively outpacing the CPI, the blue line, the jagged blue line, which is the um, consumer price index. That's the typical basket of goods um, that you buy, uh, you know, for, for normal things. What's interesting is just how much faster it's even outpaced medical services. So we know medical services are are increasing um, and and that uh, and and yet textbooks are outpacing that. Uh, the right image, sorry, it's a bit blurry, um, but um, that shows what's happened as a result of this distorted market, and that is massive consolidation. We have 
basically three companies, three publishing companies that dominate over 80, uh, 80 some percent of the uh, textbook market. So you've got um, some smaller players that sort of take up the remaining um, chunk, but the vast majority of the market is dominated by just these three players. And that means they really control prices. Like they can just raise prices as at will because they're really isn't another option. And so that shows, in fact, that the market is is broken. There's not a free market. Students don't have a choice on which textbook they can buy. And even if they did have choices, they don't have many options because there just aren't that many producers out there. So here's a couple of other problems that we may you may not be familiar with. I really love this book by uh, Mariana Mazzucato. Uh, this is called, it's called The Value of Everything. Mazzucato uh, takes us through kind of a history of value and says, you know, the idea of economic value is not a neutral concept. And it's something that we've decided over time. Um, and it has huge impacts on the way we think about things like GDP, the way we value things. So for instance, from the very beginning, we, we simply excluded government and also household production. So work done within the household was never counted as part of production of GDP, right? And neither are the work the work that the government does. These are just excluded. Um, and then in the past 75 years, we've had a massive shift in the way we think of value, where financial services uh, have have were now added into the productive capacity. So most of the the rapid rise of GDP in the United States uh, in the last 50 years has actually been in things like you know, derivatives trading, trading and very exotic sort of things that people do on Wall Street that actually doesn't produce a thing for anybody. It, except for, she calls it extractive. It, this It's market extraction, not market production. When you get to sort of things that are relevant to textbooks, you see that um, things like intellectual property protections are just in talking about this a bit. And I joined a little bit late, but I was glad to hear him talk about the problems or the, the sort of the tensions that arise out of intellectual property protections. Uh, intellectual property protections, particularly patents, you might think of it, but also copyright, um, they encourage wealth extraction because the first person to get the ideas out there in a form that can be copyrighted is the one who gains all of the, the uh, revenue from that idea. So even though it may not have been their idea, even though it may not be the best articulation of the idea, they get it because they're the first to the market. So this is what we see with like Campbell's biology textbook, which is a classic example. Everybody uses, it's the Bible for intro bio, um, not because it's the best, just because it's the first and it's a standard. Similarly, platform capitalism, this is the idea like the Facebook sort of phenomenon, right? You really, it, Facebook is not a, a, a good that is bought and sold on a market because it basically is a platform. You can't exist in certain spaces without participating in that platform. So we see similar things that uh, where companies in the education space are trying to do that, cornering the market on various platforms or software, software for educational purposes. So, um, and, and so those, these sort of features of the market encourage like one or a few producers to be able to extract all of the value out of that market. Um, so it doesn't actually do good for the, the average producer and it doesn't encourage innovation and it, and it, um, and it doesn't, it's not really fair. So let's get back to OER and what OER does and what I think is so transformative about OER. Um, in the old uh, open source movement, they used to have a phrase called free, not like free beer, they would say free like freedom. Um, that was the idea of, of the, old, uh, the old open source. And then a, a few years ago, folks in the OER movement started saying, no, it's not like free beer, it's like free puppies. And the idea was like, yeah, okay, you can get the OER, but then you have to take care of it, right? And and recognizing that there are costs associated with like caring for OER, it's free out there, but you have to do stuff with it. I think there's actually a even better slogan that I'm going to throw out there. Not that anybody's going to take it up, but if you do, please let 
uh, please do go ahead, run with it. I say f not f like free beer, but like free parks. And the reason I choose parks is because I think OER, this was my talk la at last year's Open Texas, was is that I think OER actually like what are sometimes called public goods or common pool resources. That is to say, there um, you you can't exclude people from the enjoyment of these resources. They're freely accessible to everyone. Now, the debate about whether they are public goods or common pool resources has to do with whether or not they are, are rivalrous. That is, does one person's use diminish the uh, another person's use? Uh, public goods are ones that are non-rivalrous, so anybody can use them and it never, never goes away. Common pool resources are, are things like the classic example is like a fishery or, or fish in a pond. If everybody goes in, you can't keep people from fishing in the pond, but if everybody were to fish in the pond, then there would be no more fish left, right? So you have to manage the resource. I think in some ways OER resemble public goods. In some ways they represent common pool resources. Uh, I've done some stuff on this, but um, uh, you know, you, you, uh, I think these are, it's an interesting question. The key is to realize that these are things that we share. They are community resources. And we need to think about funding models and the economics around production and labor of producing OER in those terms. As I say, we want to think about how we can produce these things and sustain them and protect them just like we would our public parks, for instance. So uh, that's the idea there. So I suppose I propose that actually the uh, the the way that we fund OER resembles a classical framework. Um, so typically the the sort of econ 101 picture I gave you is known as the neoclassical framework, the neoclassicism. Um, this is the classical framework. It's the one that Adam Smith followed, and a guy named Ricardo was the kind of the founder of it, and um, Karl Marx. And this is based on this idea that value is actually measured in terms of labor, that the value of anything is calculated as the total number of labor hours that are required to produce it. Um, now, that includes um, the labor necessary to produce the materials, as well as the labor necessary to produce any mechanisms that were used in the production of the, of the commodity. So that and then, and then when you exchange things, what you're doing is you're saying, I'm willing to exchange this amount of money for this because I would, I'm willing to trade my labor to have that device. So I want a car uh, to drive to, to and from work. Um, and I'm willing to trade like, you know, two years of labor to get that car because I think it's worth it to me. I don't know however much a car costs in terms of our labor. Two years would be a very expensive car. Um, but maybe not that. All right. I'm running low on time, so I'm going to try to wrap it up. But it's maybe familiar to many of you that Marx critiques um, uh, capitalism using the labor theory of value. And what he says is that basically capitalists, people who are able, able to amass a lot of resources, they can multiply the efficiency of labor. So he was in the industrial age and he saw machines sort of magnifying the productive capacity of workers. And what he saw though, was that the workers weren't getting compensated. They were becoming much more productive, but they weren't getting, their wages weren't increasing. And the reason why was that the capitalists could charge a market rate for labor that was far lower than what the workers were actually producing. So they were generating what he called surplus value and surplus value was the source of profit. So I think we see this kind of thing actually go on all the time in the textbook industry. They, you know, they, they pay royalties and fees to certain high profile names and maybe a few people get rich off this stuff. But the, the workers, the actual people who put together a textbook, who put together learning resources, who work on this stuff, who do peer review for it, they don't get that much money. And yet the value that's captured in that resource is then can be extracted for a very, very long time, especially with our copyright protections for the publisher. 
right? And I think this is super problematic and it's not a way to build an equitable and fair and sustainable uh, learning resource economy. And I think our OER funding models actually have it right. Think about the various private grant funding, federal funding, the state funding. Maybe you all have applied for grants or stipends, internal stipends for work in OER. And I think, and when you do that, what you have to do is you have to stipulate, how many hours am I working? How much am I gonna get paid for that? Uh, and then you stipulate, how many resources am I using? In effect, when you apply for a grant, you're using the rationale of the labor theory of value. You're thinking of the production of the resource in terms of the labor required to produce it. And I think that because of that, um, you know, it's much fairer system. There's no surplus value generated because once you produce these resources, they're publicly free and shareable. There's no alienation from the means of production because you're the one who's doing it. You're getting paid for the amount of work you're doing. Um, for this reason, I think like the, that, that, that the models we have are actually pretty good. The only thing I think that we really fall fall short on, and I'll just, I'll just put this, this is the last bullet point here, but so this is a summary of kind of everything I've said, but I think the place where we really fall short on this is really owning the implications of this. And that is we as institutions, as state level institutions, as consortia, as uh, individual colleges and universities, we have to take it upon ourselves to fund these materials adequately, the production of these materials going forward. We're the ones who are going to be responsible for sustaining, producing, and managing the instructional resources that are free and open for everyone. Um, so I think we have a way of doing it. We just have to embrace it and recognize that actually our model is a lot better than the commercial model that most people think is the, the standard. So I'll stop talking there. I saw a lot of comments in the, the text, the chat, and I wasn't able to really read them. So I'm going to try to go through them and look at this. Um, yeah, most of the resources I had, Justin, were from the Spark Network. They're outstanding. They've done so much good advocacy work. Um, yeah, it's crazy the amount that the costs have in increased. It's just, it's just amazing. Everybody has felt this. And it's it's inefficient, you know. New new uh, title, new editions coming out. The textbooks are too heavy. They're they're not useful for learning. Um, yeah, yeah. Thanks, Rebecca, about the the on the. Um, I like. I'm glad you liked my park metaphor. Um, <laughs> thank you, Amber. I'm glad you liked it too. Excellent, Ema. Thanks. Cool, cool. Well. Uh, Thanks y'all for the for the feedback on the chat. It's so fun to see that the chat popping off while I'm talking. Um, sorry for the the technical issues at the beginning, but uh, really happy to talk to you. I think I am at the end of my time. Alexa hasn't cut me off yet, but she she may at any moment. No, we do have about four minutes for oh, okay. questions. Um, so if if anyone does have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat or unmute yourself. Um, yeah, no, no worries on the technical difficulties where where you were perfect on time. Um, and I I also love the the park metaphor personally. I think it's great. So we do have um, about four minutes. So if you have questions or if you need to take a break before our next presentation, we'll begin at three fifteen Central Time. Yeah, I I'm. I'm so I'm sad I logged in about halfway through Justin's presentation, but Justin's definitely like an inspiration on this one um, to go go full Marxist on the uh, on the uh, on on the with OER. Um, but um, yeah, and and uh, um, yeah, I and Karen, I think is you know I, thank you so much for thinking about how that connects. I mean, I think you know I do think we are really have the potential to transform the way we think about uh, learning and learning resources and the produce the production of those resources. And I really think that the model we have, the kind of models we've landed on are just fairer, they're more equitable. Um, and um, yeah, I think it's, I think it's actually, uh, I think we ought to embrace that. Like, um, you know, we, we 
uh, everybody looks at us like we're doing something strange. And I, I think we ought to look at the textbook market and go, no, this is strange, right? 100%. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yes, Sabrina, t-shirts, outstanding. Going, going full Marxist on OER. I love it. All right. Justin made a good recommendation for some Marx reading. I had a 8 a.m. philosophy class back in college, so I think I'm good on reading Marx, <laughs> but I will watch and listen to Justin talk about Marx and how it applies to OER instead. <laughs> yeah, Marx is not the easiest reading himself, uh, but um, there's a really good free... Um, lecture series on YouTube that I'll pop. Um, this is just one of the chapters. Um, it's this uh, Professor David Harvey who goes through. Um, oh, goodness. Oh, I'm still sharing my screen. Sorry about that. Yeah, See my tabs. Yeah. But anyway, I'll throw that in the chat. Um, and he he kind of he kind of talks you through it. It's long, but it's nice to listen to in the background and stuff. Oh yeah, okay. And Justin's also re recommending Sam Popovich. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I mean that. Yeah, I mean the critical period in the late nineteenth century is a really interesting one. I just think, like, we ought to spend a lot more time reflecting on that because you know that was the t time of the industrial revolution, and in so many ways we're undergoing revolutions right now in terms of the way our economy is structured. And I think like like that kind of critical thought at that time is actually more relevant today than it's been in a long time. We're going to get started in just a minute. Um, Laurel, if you want to start sharing your screen, we can get that set up. Thank you so much, Nathan. And thank you, everyone, for your comments and chat. Um, I know we've we've talked a lot about you know the cost of textbooks and how it's changed over time. But as I mentioned in the chat, I was a an English and history double major. So my books were were not, you know, the $300 chem, bio, science, math kind of books. Um, so yeah, it is, it's heartbreaking to, to, to listen to students talk about it. Okay, um, welcome to our next session for today's uh, session of Open Texas 2022. I am Alexa Height with the Open Texas Conference Committee and will be emceeing our session. Thank you all for joining us today for deliberations before running another Wikipedia editing assignment. Uh, just a reminder to mute your microphones and turn off your video unless you are um, our presenter. And we will hopefully have time at the end for some Q&A, but feel free to drop any questions in the chat while um, Laurel takes us away. There we go. I think I'm unmuted. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for sticking around late in the day. Um, Today, uh, I'm hoping to bring um, kind of a more hands-on illustration of some of the things that we've been hearing about this afternoon. I'm talking about an OER, uh, a resource that's used to instruct students, but also one that's used um, and is shaped by students. And that is using Wikipedia editing assignments in the classroom. Wikipedia is an ongoing crowdsourced reference work that anyone can log on to to create new content. However, uh, the choice of page topics, for example, is very unevenly distributed, such that many topics that students may want to read about are insufficiently covered or have insufficient references or are just not covered at all. And having students help improve the pages on the topics or the scholars that they're studying can be a great way for them to synthesize sources and share their work for future students and for the larger community. There are some upright, um, upfront barriers to learning the editing interface and learning the citation policies required by Wikipedia. And for instructors, um, it can be tricky fitting in editing work in classes that are also presenting course information in the student's discipline that you also want them to learn. In that way, the process may really work very differently for undergrads versus graduate classes 
for larger sections and for smaller seminars. My goal in this presentation is to weigh the cognitive costs, the emotional labor of such classroom editing projects for both instructors and for students, pulling from my own, own experiences um, after semesters, uh, six semesters of using such assignments in my classes, um, both from before and during the COVID era, so online and um, in person. Um, I'm going to assess the return on investment in instructor time and attention reviewing what has worked best and what has been a struggle for setting up editing projects, which in my case um, were aimed at expanding stubs of Wikipedia pages in the area of linguistics. I'm an associate professor at UT Arlington in the linguistics department. There we go. So I would say that successfully launching this kind of engaged learning task encompasses two main aspects. One is helping to fill in Wikipedia content gaps within a discipline, and then helping build up student research skills. So page content gap is, equates to what my colleague Amber Rayleigh yesterday referred to as better representational justice. That is noticing whose history, whose story is told in the Wikipedia pages, what topics are covered well, or even covered at all. In addition, Creating the OER of Wikipedia enables the larger project, the Wikipedia project itself, to increase the number and range of editors on the site. Because right now, no more than 20% of Wikipedia editors are female, and most of them are from English speaking countries. So, um, my thought has been bringing our students with their more diverse backgrounds on board, um, and in my field is a majority female uh, field of linguistics. This enables more people to add to or to create whole pages in areas where they have uh, content interest or where they have language expertise. So um, another OER topic that I've heard referenced a number of times across the past couple of days um, has to do with costs. So Wikipedia is free to read and free to edit. So it's making lots more information accessible to readers around the globe if college students can contribute their knowledge, their building knowledge, and their library access to the encyclopedia that all of us use. Instructors are increasingly tailoring OER coursework for their own students' needs, right? So it's very classroom specific. Um, collaborative articles made in wikis can really serve as a kind of reusable, um, sometimes called little OER, right? Where writers create and openly share knowledge with fewer of the upfront costs than those involved in producing a whole OER course or a book series. So I'm going to go back to these two points of filling in content gaps and building up research skills. Um, the first one, for that topic, I want to say that energy spent on content gap concerns um, means that the time uh, includes things like the time spent by the instructor in finding relevant page topics for the students to work with so that they have a choice of some existing pages in their discipline that need beefing up. Um, there is a lot of research on why, for example, pages on female scholars are much less uh, represented than male scholars, or why pages on certain popular culture topics like sitcoms and hip hop and anime and sports teams have much better representation in Wikipedia than core topics in science and humanities courses. So addressing these gaps and the cultural bias in coverage is itself a topic for students to become aware of. Filling the gap includes both instructors and students recognizing some special constraints. For instance, if you're editing biography pages, um, there's um, additional things that need to be concerned with, especially for living people. The special care needs to be taken. And then a, a range of secondary sources needs to be sought that goes beyond just looking for the subject's social media profiles and web pages, right? One actual discussion of their work. Filling a content gap includes seeking appropriately copyrighted graphics. And this is a surprise for lots of students. It means introducing background on um, helping them differentiate how just because an image is snatchable from the web doesn't mean it qualifies as a uh, Creative Commons copyright or is shareable by others. And lastly, um, these kind of efforts include taking advantage of the modularity of pages. And I'll talk about that again in a minute, but so on a page, for instance, covering minority languages, 
um, student editors can bring their knowledge in from those areas where they currently have or are developing some strengths. So maybe they know about the syntax, or maybe they know about phonology, maybe they have geographical knowledge of a particular language community. So they can build up a page in a way that's relevant to their class and leave other aspects to edit uh, editors in other sub-disciplines. Um, as for the energy spent on the topic of students building their research and technology skills, this entails aspects such as supporting students in being comfortable sharing their nascent knowledge by helping them build up solid backing for their claims. Uh, it also entails managing instructor time to track students' training on the wiki editing tools, which is in addition to keeping track of any existing content assignments that they do in the class. It means incorporating the benefits of group work for students so that they can practice library skills training together and build up references for a page that they're working on in unison. And it also requires that all participants maintain the attention needed to integrate the wiki edu interface, which is used um, to build the um, materials into any other kind of online course tools that the class is already using. For me, um, integrating the Wikipedia editing task into a class that I'd already taught several times in the past required thinking really carefully about how to balance the old and the new parts of the uh, assignments for students. I mentioned WikiEDU is an organization that supports instructors in doing these kind of classroom editing tasks. They recommend, and I concur, that students respond better to completing the kinds of training and setting up a Wikipedia account, practicing inserting sources, reading through the um, policies on uh, Wikipedia's policies on plagiarism and such. They respond much better if they get some class points for doing these steps and make sure that they build up the skills. So balancing points from their traditional linguistic analysis homework and uh, in you know, the class topics that we're learning about, in addition to points for trying out the Wikipedia interface, um, this actually added a bit of logistical panic for me because I felt like we had a lot of moving pieces. And I didn't want to just add a bunch of new modules to an already full syllabus. Um, so I had made several attempts to do this. Here is one where I attempted to lay out alternating coverage of the material in our textbook with material in the Wikipedia training. Um, the reading material for the top part of the course uh, has content that had originally been a traditional textbook and over the semesters, over the years, it has shifted to an OER volume. Um, and then I readjusted the sequence of these tasks across a couple of semesters. Um, and I had really started out reluctant to eliminate any of the core assignments. Like they can't really learn pragmatics if I eliminate one of the tasks that they traditionally do. Um, but honestly, later, I found that being willing to do fewer topics and have them tackle them through a greater range of tasks, it really aligned with this goal for simplification that I've been aiming for ever since our pivot to online during COVID, where we're suddenly learning many modalities and many tools. Um, this summer, I found this lovely graphic that you can see here from a talk by Jessamine Neuhaus, who is uh, Geeky Pedagogy on Twitter. And this applies so well at the beginning of every semester for me, but especially in those times when I'm trying to weave in this new OER editing modality. So you can see the colorful headings um, cover the key goals for any instructors who maybe cut down on content, cultivate community, create clear connections, and convey care. But in particular, um, I point your attention especially to the top two items in the left column, which say to offer less content, but more ways to access and engage with the content, right? And make it a snack buffet and not a sit down meal, right? So not everything is about a full fledged research paper that they produce. Um, and also to the bo boxed item on the lower right hand column, um, which says emphasize how humans learn that a tired, scared, distracted, overloaded brain cannot learn well, um, and neither can such brain teach well as we've all learned. So what I wanna say is that in working together on Wikipedia pages, the chance that students have to learn, to recombine, to explain to their group mates, to find library sources that are backing up the things they're finding, to communicate these to general readers, 
these tasks let everyone in the class take part in building up good OER material for their field. So some takeaways from having done this several times, if you're considering adding some Wikipedia editing into your students' research practices, um, though it adds one more tech layer for students and instructors to master, the WikiEDU web interface is really rich and well supported um, and well worth getting to know before your semester starts. Um, it allows you to do a week by week order of the tasks you want them to do. And it offers training modules on how students can cite sources. It also provides space for students to practice their drafting and citation skills um, in their individual groups. It's visible to you and to them, and they can um, rearrange things before it ever goes visible to anyone else. Um, what you see here is a shot of the WikiEDU dashboard for one of my past courses. There were 29 students enrolled. By the end of the course, they'd contributed in some ways to 45 different Wikipedia articles. Um, they primarily worked in groups to each build um, one page. I think there were six groups in the class, but they also all practiced finding and adding appropriate scholarly citations to a range of other articles. So they could start tweaking projects even if it wasn't their, their main class project. Related to that, um, I want to note that students don't have to create a whole page from scratch, which I think would be daunting. Um, and experienced editors don't sit down and do that in just a couple of weeks either. Um, they, so what students can do is work on making a subsection for an existing page, or can contribute to adding appropriate photos or references to scholarly bios in their discipline. Um, in other words, it's not just full pages of prose that are needed. There's a diversity of types of coverage to create. Um, in this article here on interjections that you can see, um, there's a short lead paragraph, and after that, a table of contents is automatically generated when new subsections are created by the editors. So students can go in and add those, they can add sections, they can recombine existing ones as they think about the organization of the larger page. So it really helps them with their outlining skills to see how their contributions fit to other people's and should they be combined, is something redundant, and so on. Um, I also wanted to note that students really love the insider knowledge aspect of finding out what um, things about Wikipedia topics, like how new page topics are created and how it's influenced by wider cultural biases. Um, they also love that existing pages all have multiple writers and copy editors working on them. Um, there's a tab that you can um, click on any Wikipedia page and you can see the edit history and it reveals this really fun secret knowledge that this is the backside where they can view the contributions of a section of one of the, their group pages or anybody's pages. You can see the number of characters that each person contributed or deleted. Um, often they'll leave notes, as you see in parentheses, added a header, um, moved a citation, more geographic info, and so on. But for any page that is out there, students were really amazed to see that there may be 10 years of edits, right, by hundreds of different users on a single page. And I think it helps disrupt the panic that they feel that they need to be a lone genius writer. Um, and it lets the idea of revision and continual improvement be normalized by a, a resource that they took for granted was a very static entity. So incorporating Wikipedia editing in a class, um, it does take more time than the usual class prep. Each class of students will have different levels of confidence in the tech and in their own writing. Each course will have a, a different available pages to work on or to create, right? Maybe people have started more stubs in phonology than they have in um, uh, North American minority languages. If you wanna help your students contribute to this kind of OER resource, I have several recommendations to help maintain your own sanity, okay? Uh, which would be to first um, be sure to incorporate um, any available on-campus training. And this includes being in communication with your librarians, right? Um, checking to see if there are any Wikipedians and residents on your campus who might already um, be eager to share their knowledge on this, um, if there's one available. See if there's other faculty on your campus who've used these kind of editing tasks in their discipline. Compare notes before you begin. 
and um, check for any kind of themed editathons that the campus groups may have going on. That is sometimes like the women's and gender group or LGBTQ groups will be doing um, themed editathons where you, create, you improve Wikipedia pages on certain topics. This can be a chance for your students to see this outside of the classroom as well. I'd also say to start small. I've used Wikipedia tasks for large and small classes, for grads and for undergrads. Um, and I found it is especially useful. Um, it's great in, for group work. So it's in that way, it's good for a big class, but it's just really nice for independent studies and honors contracts. When you want to assign an additional kind of work for a student who has um, wants to keep on in that discipline. Um, and that often means that students already have a real focus for the semester and they want to start gathering what knowledge is out there and uh, applying some of their own research to beef up the pages. Finally, if your department has the option, um, of course, as an instructor, if you can incorporate any kind of a TA or an RA who can assist with the uh, Wikipedia interface, and can help you circulate among the groups in class, that's a big help too. You have someone to compare notes with as you're looking at the um, projects from an instructor's point of view. Uh, in short, what I wanna say is that if you have a semester coming up when you don't have 10 other extra projects going on, then I really encourage you to try this out as an OER production task. It was really rewarding for the students each time I've done it. It's been rewarding for me as the instructor and honestly, it's been rewarding for our discipline to see the, uh, the development of pages that students can come back and refer to. Um, that is pretty much it. These are the references of the things I mentioned. Um, I can drop the WikiEDU one in the chat. And I'm very happy to take any questions. I'll, I'll unshare now. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. If anybody does have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat or unmute and ask your question. Yeah, I'm just checking the chat myself, thank you. Um, would impact the, re the cognitive and redistributive justice as well as the representation. Yeah, I absolutely agree, Amber. I, I, I wanted to parallel so many good talks that I've heard in the past couple of days because I think these things can be applied in a number of ways. Thank you, Laurel. Um, we do have a few questions or a few minutes, sorry, and then I saw a chat come in. Um, Cynthia says, I'm curious about the range of classes that this could be used in. Do you have any suggestions for that? Yeah, I, I do. Um, so on the one hand, I've used it with graduate seminars, which was great because, of course, the students already knew something about the topic and they were there to fine tune their knowledge. This was on a discourse markers class, right? Um, um, I've also used it several times with a senior level undergrad class um, in pragmatics. Uh, and what's a little bit trickier there is that's a class where this is the first time they've encountered that discipline and they need to learn it first before they're going to be comfortable sharing it. Um, but they're also aware that there's a lot of things they want to learn. They go to Wikipedia and stuff's not there. <laughs> so it's a really good illustration of why we can't take for granted that some outside person is just building this tool for you that you need to figure out what needs to be done. And it's worked great as honors contracts in lieu of like writing an extra research paper, you say, you choose some pages so that fit your theme and we'll, we'll you know, integrate those and work on building them up. Um, yeah, I, I, th there's, there's great training out there. I, I learned through my professional organization, the Linguistic Society of America, I used to do some training session for uh, um, people to consider trying this out um, to bring it to their classes and that got me going. And then I did some training through our library had, um, that WikiEDU had paired up with. So before I tried it, I got to hear some other people talking about their problems and issues too. There are exhausting parts to it, but it's a really satisfying task. So um, yeah, I would love to see other people try to integrate that with their coursework. Right. Sorry, was I not visible? Sorry about that. 
<laughs> no worries, you're fine. Um, we do have a few more minutes. We've got about three minutes until our next uh, presenter. Um, it looks like we might have some interest, Laurel, in some collaboration. Yeah, I would be interested in collaborating too. So um, Manisha, tell, uh, would send me a note and let me know what you're thinking about. All right, we have about three minutes until our next presentation. Um, so if you do need to take a break, feel free. Um, and Yang, if you want to start sharing your screen, please feel free to do that. Excellent. All righty. We will get started in just about two minutes, everyone. Um, Leah just put in the chat um, a link to the post-conference survey, so please feel free to give us your feedback, and Laurel shared um, wikidu.org as well. Okay, it is 340 Central Time, so we are going to get started. Thank you everyone for coming to a later in the day on a Friday session of Open Texas 2022. I am Alexa Height. I am the moderator um, for this afternoon's session. Um, so thank you for joining us for supporting robotics, OER creation. Um, before I let Dr. Wu take it away, just a reminder to mute your, your mic and your camera if you are not speaking. Okay, uh, so I guess I'll begin. So thank you, Alexa. Uh, hi everyone, uh, thank you for being at my presentation. And I want to talk to you about project management techniques um, that can be used in large grant funded projects supporting the development of complex and innovative um, OER materials that fill gaps in OER resources like resources and also foster interdisciplinary um, collaboration in these projects. So, Large uh, grant funded OER development projects are becoming increasingly common uh, nowadays. Um, and I think there's several reasons. One is that OER is becoming complex and there's also an interest in developing more innovative OER, particularly in gap areas like robotics um, that can enhance student uh, learning in new ways. Personally, I feel that large grant funded projects can be useful as a way of drawing local attention to OER and 
from uh, being from South Carolina, I think, you know, having large OER projects is a good way to kind of, you know, get attention from uh, university administrations and other people um, on the need for OER and to also, you know, develop some, something large to show them the benefits of OER. But large grant funded projects can be complex because grant funding agencies often require um, multi-institutional or and certainly interdisciplinary collaboration to develop these OER things. And in order to be innovative, you really need interdisciplinary collaboration. Um, and since these are large granted, uh, grant funded projects, there are also issues related to two areas, uh, project management, as well as team management. And I want to kind of talk to you a little bit about kind of the issues involved in project managing large grant funded OER projects. Um, from my example, as the PI of a large grant funded project from the Department of Education to develop uh, OER uh, robotics uh, uh, mat uh, learning materials. Um, and this is drawn mostly from the first year of my experience in managing a three year grant funded project. Um, so a little bit about the project itself. Um, this project is uh, something that involves three academic in institutions, um, and it seeks to develop three robotics textbooks supporting really um, teaching of the subject in three levels. One is the technical college, the two-year level, four-year undergraduate, and the graduate levels. And we want to make these very innovative to support students from many backgrounds. So these books will include um, two formats, an ebook format and a print format for students in rural areas. And we're thinking this from the perspective of the cells where many students in rural areas might not have uh, strong bandwidth. Um, to make, to, uh, to support innovative learning and to turn course, uh, to draw connections between course learning and also uh, real life situations. And also at some levels to encourage the connection between concepts that you learn um, through the book to workplace situations. These books will have a lot of interactive animations and simulations demonstrating practical applications of, um, the, uh, uh, of the concepts that students learn. And also there will be a lot of interactive kind of uh, questions and exercises that support student personalized learning. And these are actually some screenshots from the textbooks being produced. And we want to make these textbooks very inclusive, that they're accessibility friendly and they have examples, content and other things that support learning of students uh, from many different backgrounds. So how did this project start? And I think this in many ways shaped um, the project management challenges as well as team management challenges that I encountered. Um, this project started as a really kind of a top-down coalition building in terms of grant writing. Now, I myself have no background in uh, robotics, but however, I am a specialized OER librarian at my institution, Clemson University. Um, I have strong knowledge of OER and have supported faculty in producing simpler OER on different uh, projects. And one of my allies, I approached him, which, uh, who is a dean in the College of Engineering at my institution. And I approached him, as well as the uh, dean of uh, my own inst uh, libraries, um, about a project um, seeking grant funding from the Department of Education's Open Textbook Pilot, uh, grant, uh, pilot grant about developing um, some type of complex material. And um, the dean of engineering um, at my institution was very interested um, through him, I also contacted two other uh, deans um, in engineering, one from an HBCU and another from a technical college, and they also felt that there was a strong need to develop OER in robotics. Um, so the deans went out of their way to find people from their respective colleges to participate in the grant writing and the project. They also got um, you know, stakeholder support from major corporations and other things from my state. We submitted a grant and in uh, last year, at the start of the grant, we were awarded close to $760,000 by the Department of Education for the project. 
Now, I think the, this is a, definitely a great success. And I think the factors behind the success is that we were an interdisciplinary collaboration. We were also a collaboration between multi-institutions with a library applying its expertise as a glue in holding together this coalition. And there was all, uh, overwhelming support from administrators um, in different institutions. But of course, um, you know, what we found is that, you know, project managing this has a lot of challenges. Primarily, it's the nature of our project. It's something that's never been done before. And we also, because we want to produce so many things, this project is going to have multiple components. One is that um, there's going to be textbook writing, but there's also going to be developing all the ancillary materials I, uh, I talked about to make the um, uh, works produced fit the needs of students from many backgrounds. There has to be strong instructional design and educational research. And to create professional uh, quality publications, we also need um, professional publishing support. And these different elements have to work together, kind of like cogs turning at the same time to ensure that we produce the, uh, the uh, output in the, uh, uh, during the duration of the project. Um, in order to do all the things we want. We also ended up developing a very large project team of really just different groups doing different tasks, um, which ended up being over a dozen faculty and staff from the three institutions and um, you know, eight or nine other student assistants. But this is something that requires a lot of project management skills. Um, and it's also something that I haven't uh, navigated this before. Um, project management and OER grant funded projects, particularly large ones, have not been explored as much um, as some other areas. So what I did is I used an approach of learning through doing. I implemented different steps to see how they work, and I made adjustments um, based on the outcomes I saw. While I made adjustments, I also actively pursued many areas of um, learning to enhance my knowledge to manage the project. Um, that includes project management strategies, um, the design of OER textbooks um, for robotics. I know how to, how to uh, write a regular OER textbook, but robotics is a very unique subject that needs a lot of um, attention as well. Um, I needed, since I'm not a robotics expert, I needed to understand um, you know, what the team members are specifically doing. And I also needed team management techniques. So for project management, I ended up picking one strategy and that's agile. So agile is a, project, is a project management strategy developed first in the software industry in the 1990s, but has been applied to a lot of other things. Um, it's based on several approaches that I think are very important given my kind of background and the need to learn and also the complexity of the task. Um, one is that it advocates an incremental approach to developing a product. Instead of elaborately planning things, um, you have the project team complete different components of the project in small uh, parts, always kind of analyzing uh, how things are going and the uh, product could be adjusted as well. Also, you know, the, a lot of adjustments in terms of time spent on certain tasks, resource allocations, and even the design of the materials could be um, adjusted. And it emphasizes close communication between team members, as well as feedback in constantly improving the product. This is something that I feel is kind of important because I needed to learn more about uh, the managing the project, we needed a flexible approach for developing the project. And applying Agile um, has, been over, uh, has been fairly successful. I also like Agile because there's a simplicity, uh, simplicity of roles in project management. In fact, Agile only has two roles uh, specifically for managing a project. One is the product owner. That's a person who keeps a list of tasks for the project, guides it, um, sets deliverables, makes um, adjustments based on what they see um, on the progress of the project, and also allocates, uh, allocates resources. There's also another person, um, the scrum master or facilitator, 
who guides um, learn uh, who guides um, you know team building um, and fosters common norms. The two roles guide the project, and the two roles also are constantly in touch with project members. Um, and uh, so, basically, um, you know, they allow for flexible communication and adjustment of the, the project. For year one of my project, I first focused more on the product owner role because I need to better understand approaches to developing the project. Secondly, um, I ended up focusing a bit more on the Scrum Master and facilitator role. I ended up, um, you know, in the second half of the year, focusing more on the second role is it? because I began to see, although the project is going well, we had some team management issues. One is that there's a need to transform all project members into active participants. All members were actively working on things, but some members were not active thinkers in improving the project. And a part of this is some members um, tend to be fairly dominant um, over others. Another reason is that, you know, the different project members uh, they're from different disciplines like uh, computer sciences, engineering, and other uh, publishing and other things. They had a difficulty understanding each other's languages. They're all from different professions or disciplines, and they had no way of speaking in a common language. And with this, there's also an issue of, you know, if the people, um, you know, don't uh, speak a common language, they often lack track of the bigger picture of the project. And there's also a need to develop more effective team interaction. And this is because of the top-down nature of the how the project got started. Deans appointed people. Um, the people were not used to working with people outside of their disciplines. And they're also, you know, they need some communication um, in terms of managing uh, larger fostering team norms. So I, after some research, began to apply the second um, kind of facilitation component of Agile, which is strategic doing. And what that is, is it's something that's designed to facilitate closely uh, connect, uh, loosely connected networks, which is my project. It's made of people from different disciplines and different institutions, um, but it enables these loosely connected um, networks to take quick action-oriented actions and adjust these, um, uh, what they do. Uh, there's also an emphasis on building trust, civility amongst you know, interdisciplinary and translational teams in some ways. And also it argues that there is a central leader in directing things, but the leader is something that actively encourages collaboration and mutual input from different members. So I saw also very strong aspects of the product, uh, like kind of, of how strategic doing related to the project. There's, it's focused on increasing the purpose of group interactions, um, also increasing the participation of everyone and exploring you know, their assets. Um, it's about establishing fair norms for managing a, a team uh, uh, related to a project. And it's also kind of building mutual understanding what I really liked about um, strategic doing through its application is that it starts very simple. Um, it starts with things like framing questions. It, these are kind of general positive questions around kind of bigger issues that you want to address. Like for example, you can ask the, the team who are mostly kind of instructors, you know, if we want to create a robotics textbook, what would be the perfect one for you to uh, look like? And this is a way of getting them to think about the bigger picture at first. Um, and also thinking from this, um, you get to think about, you know, what are things we should do? What are some roles? Um, who has the ex expertise to what? And this is about getting people to form a common language around um, identifying big picture. And also there are many, um, you know, facilitation techniques for getting people um, to think about uh, you know, um, how do we get everybody to participate equally? How do we make sure that everybody's opinion is heard? How do we control the flow of discussions so that we, through every meeting, would get, um, you know, clear results, assignment roles, and other things as well? Um, 
I found this is useful, but I also found that there are larger issues as well with project managing a large, complex, interdisciplinary project. One is the issue of facilitation. I tried using the techniques, but I've also found that, you know, it's a complex thing. Um, I would suggest, you know, I started this a little bit late, but it might be good to hire at first a professional team manager or facilitator of discussions. Um, and Agile really emphasizes that, you know, the facilitator as somebody being an outsider who is simply there to enforce fair rules um, so, and manage discussions. And once the role, uh, the roles, um, everybody understands the rules and the roles and within discussions and everything, uh, there's no need for a facilitator anymore. And everybody is going to work as a group to enforce rules. And also another issue I wanted to explore is kind of simplifying workflow. Uh, I found Agile, uh, while it has many benefits, there's a lot of meetings, a lot of work, which is not necessarily very good when you also have your librarian's responsibilities. How to simplify you know, all the work? And it could be possible that with a more cohesive team um, you know, and better understanding of uh, project tasks and more work experience, things will be simpler. But there is an a, a, there's an importance when you're managing this type of projects to simplify the workflow and cut down the time that everyone wants to spend. And especially, it's especially important because many members are faculty members who don't have a lot of time. Uh, so this is my experience. Uh, thank you very much. And I will follow the uh, chat to see if there's any questions. Awesome. Thank you so much. It is 3.58, so we don't have a ton of time, but if anyone has any questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat or unmute yourself. Um, I am going to put in the chat the uh, post-conference survey if you have um, some feedback for us. Um, and please join me in thanking um, Dr. Yang Wu, Dr. Laurel Savan, uh, Justin White, Leah DeForest, and Nathan Smith for this, uh, this afternoon's block of presentations. Um, everything was so interesting and fascinating. So thank you all very much. And again, if you do have questions, um, please take some time now to ask those. I do believe that the wrap up final session does begin right at four o'clock. So feel free to peel away if we don't have any lingering questions, everyone. Yes, thank you all so much. Those were great presentations. Okay, it is four o'clock, so I am going to stop the recording.